because the recursive definition of the determinant runs into the problem that it's just computationally really very expensive, right? If you want to calculate the determinant of a three by three matrix, you end up calculating three determinants of two by two matrices. If you want to calculate the determinant of a four by four matrix, you've got to calculate four three by three determinants. And each of those three by three determinants requires three two by two determinants. If you've got a, a five by five matrix, you need to calculate five four by four determinants. Each of those requires four three by three determinants. Each of those requires three two by two determinants. So it's a hell of a lot of work, right? The, the computation grows uh, as n factorial, right? If you've got an n by n matrix, you've got, got to do basically n factorial two by two determinants. And that's, that's a lot. So we're going to try to see if there's a better way to calculate determinants. And this is something that we discussed right at the end of the last lecture. Uh, we said that if we've got certain types of matrix, right? If you've got a matrix which is a diagonal matrix or an upper triangular matrix or a lower triangular matrix, then it's very easy to calculate the determinant. The determinant is simply the product of the entries on the diagonal. Okay. And this uh, turns out to be really useful because what we can do, what we'll see today, is that if we take an arbitrary n by n matrix and we'd like to calculate its determinant, we can Gauss reduce it and we'll Gauss reduce it and when you do Gauss reduction, it becomes an upper triangular matrix. And in the process of doing Gauss reduction, all of the operations that we do when we do Gauss reduction have a... Why are you all coming in so late? we do in Gauss reduction, we'll be able to see that they've got a very simple effect on the determinant. So we'll take our, our complicated matrix, we'll Gauss reduce it, we'll keep track of what we've done in the Gauss reduction, we'll calculate the determinant of the upper triangular matrix very quickly, and then just adjust it because of all the things we've done in the Gauss reduction. Okay. Uh, I guess actually something that I forgot to say, which is just that if you have a, a tutorial today on Tuesday, the venue has changed. We're no longer in MCB LT2. It was a little bit cramped. I've convinced venues to give us a bigger venue, so we're in LS2A. So that's in Leslie Social Science. Okay, so let's just uh, remind ourselves a little bit about Gauss reduction. And there are certain elementary row operations that you're allowed to do when you're doing Gauss reduction. And there are three types of elementary row operations. Does anyone remember what they are? What is the first thing that you can do when you're doing Gauss reduction? Yeah, so you can scale a row, scale a row by k, which is not equal to zero. Scale a row by a non-zero scalar. Uh, what else can we do? What was that? Subtract, Subtract rows. That's, that's going to be number three. Add rows. That's also going to be number three. So you can switch rows. You can swap two, two rows. So let's say you can exchange two rows, swap. Swap two rows, and then some people said, where are you all coming from? Um, you can add or subtract a scalar multiple of one row from another row. Right, so add or subtract. I suppose we don't have to say add or subtract since we've got scalar multiple in there and the scalar might be a negative uh, number. So we can just add a multiple of one row. Add a 
add a multiple of one row to <coughs> another row. So I want to just look at an example, a very simple example. We'll, we'll think about a two by two matrix. Um, and once we've looked at this two by two matrix, we'll maybe be able to take, make some guesses about the effect that each of these operations has on the, the determinant. And then we'll try to actually show that those guesses are true. Right, let's see. So how do these affect? How Wait, is that not supposed to be an affect? I can never remember which one is the verb and which one is the noun. Is that right? Okay, good. <laughs> so how do these affect the determinant? Okay, so let's take a look at an example. Um, we're just going to take a very simple two by two matrix and we'll calculate its determinant. So we'll say uh, the determinant of 1, 2, 3, 4. So it's 1 times by 4 minus 2 times by 3. So 1 times by 4, 4 minus 2 times by 3, 4 minus 6. That's equal to minus 2. Okay. Then we could scale a row by k not equal to 0. So let's say we've got a row here which is instead of 1, 2, let's multiply everything by 5. So we have 5, 10, 3, 4, and you can calculate the determinant. Uh, and we can swap two rows, so we'd have 3, 4, 1, 2, right? And then we could add a multiple of one row to another row. So let's say we've got 1, 2, and we've got 3, 4, say 3 plus 2, and 4 plus 4, right? So I've added two times the first row to the second row. So two and four, added them over here. So take a moment and calculate those, uh, those determinants. Okay, so this uh, up here, what is the determinant of this matrix? Negative 10. Okay, because it's 5 times by 4 is 20, negative 30, negative 20, negative, sorry, 20 minus 30 is negative 10. And that one at the bottom there? 2. And this one over here? Negative 2. All right. So the guesses that we might make, and what we're going to try to show is that if you scale a row, over here we've scaled this first row by a factor of 5. If you scale a row by uh, a constant k, then the determinant is also scaled by that constant k. Over here we've swapped these two rows, and the determinant changes sign, and that's something which turns out to be true in general. If you swap two rows, your determinant stays the same value, it just changes sign. And this is maybe the most surprising one. If I take a scalar multiple of one row and I add it to another row, the value of the determinant doesn't change. And this also is true in general. So we're going to try to um, show that all of these things are true. So let's start with, uh, in fact, let's just remind ourselves of the, the following formula. If you want to calculate the determinant of A, we can write it in the following way. We can write it 
as a sum write it as the following sum aij that's the particular um, constant right in the i throw in the jth column minus 1 to the i plus j with just this plus minus plus minus sort of checkerboard pattern of signs and then mij over here this is the minor right that's the determinant of a smaller matrix that you find by omitting the i throw and the jth column so let's see if we can actually show if we can sort of prove these guesses that we've made. So the first thing we might say is the following. So fact 2.3. Let's say. So let B be a matrix. Contained from A. So let B be a matrix which is obtained from A by scaling its P throws, by scaling row P by a non zero constant K. Then the determinant of B. The determinant of B is just K times by the determinant of A. Right, so we're really talking about the matrix in the top left and the top right. You can see that that matrix 5, 10, 3, 4 was obtained by taking the matrix 1, 2, 3, 4 and scaling the first row by a factor of 5. And all that's happened to the determinant, the determinant was minus 2, now the determinant is negative 10, the determinant has also been scaled by a factor of 5. Right? So if you got B from A by scaling a row by a factor of 5, you get determinant of B from the determinant of A by scaling by that same factor. Okay. And now let's see if we can try to explain this, and we're going to explain it using this expression over here. Okay. So here's the explanation. We're going to calculate the determinant of B using that formula up there, by, uh, but we, we're not going to do it on an arbitrary row. We're going to expand along row P. So calculate determinant of B by expanding along row P. Use uh, BIJ of B and N J. Okay, so that's just an extra little line here explaining the notation that I'm going to use. So if we want to calculate the determinant of B, determinant of B is going to be the sum. And we sum over J going from 1 up to N. And we're going to sum along the pth row, row P, column J, minus 1 to the P plus J. And then we need to calculate the minors. Although these are not the minus nij, they're the minus npj, because we're in the pth row. And what we want to do now is, in some way, relate this expression here back to the expression that we had up there for the determinant of A. So can anyone tell me, I mean, <laughs> these entries b, p, j, what could we replace them with? P times by IJ. Oh, sorry, P times A. 
Okay, so okay, sure. So, so it's not p times will be k times, but yes, you can get this with k times by a p j, right? So this is the same thing as k times by a p j, right? At least that little first bit. Okay, we're still summing n goes from one. Oh, I've run out of space. J is equal to 1, K, A, P, J. The minus 1 is still minus 1 to the P plus J. And now I've got to find some way of relating these minus N of B and the minus M of A. So what is the relationship between the minus in this matrix B and the minus in the matrix A? They don't change. Why don't they change? That's exactly right. Okay. So the suggestion is that NPJ and MPJ must be exactly the same. And the reason for this is the only change we've made is in the pth row, we scaled the pth row by the constant k. When you calculate the minors in the pth row, you delete that row for calculating the minors. So all the other entries in A and B are exactly the same. So the minors in that row agree. The minors in the other rows don't agree, but the minors in this row do agree. So we can replace NPJ with MPJ, right? Maybe uh, we can see if we can fit in an explanation over here. NPJ equals MPJ since uh, we omit changed entries to calculate minors, right? And now this over here, this k is just a constant. We can pull this k outside of the sum. And then we're basically done, right? Because once we pull it outside of the sum, we've got k times by this sum over here, n. j is equal to 1 a p j minus 1 to the p plus j m p j. And this bit here is just the definition of the determinant of a. So that's just k times by the determinant of a. Right. Let me zoom out a bit and we can fit everything on one screen at the same time. Does anyone have any questions about what we've done here or about this explanation? Yes? I mean, so one thing which you can maybe think about is that these elementary row operations, um, every elementary row operation corresponds to an elementary matrix as well. And that elementary matrix is also a linear transformation. So this over here, this, there'd be an elementary matrix of the following form. Let me just maybe put it here where you'd have ones on the diagonal and you'd have a K in some position and all the other entries would be equal to zero, right? And, and th this matrix over here looks a lot like the identity matrix, and it doesn't matter if you multiply on the left by this matrix or on the right by this matrix. So in some way, the order doesn't matter. But this is a linear transformation which just takes your k axis, your kth axis, and stretch, or just takes out your piece axis, sorry, and stretches it by a factor of k. So that's sort of maybe what you're getting at here in, in terms of linear transformations. Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, yes. Yeah, exactly. Right. So if you scale the first row by a factor of two and the third row by a factor of five, your determinant changes by a factor of ten. So you scale it by two and then you scale it by five. 
All right. All right. So that was uh, fact 2.3, and that was something about this first uh, row operation, that if you scale a row by k, which is not equal to zero, you scale the determinant. So let's take a look at the next one, uh, which is going to be fact 2.4. So if B is obtained from A by exchanging two rows, then the determinant of B is minus the determinant of A. And the explanation for this is something that you will see or you'll actually do for yourselves in the tutorial. It's, I think, a tough problem next week. So this will be... be something that you'll do for yourself. The basic idea is that you'll start by showing what happens when you exchange two adjacent rows, and then you'll work from there. Okay. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time speaking about this now. If you have any questions after next week's start about this, come and speak to me. Right. Fact 2.5. is the following. So if the matrix A has two identical rows, matrix A has two identical rows, then the determinant of A is equal to zero. We've got two identical rows, then the determinant of A is equal to zero. Any suggestions for why this is true or how we might understand this? Okay, so if you're thinking about the determinant as representing the volume of something under this transformation, you're saying that, yeah, okay, so in some sense, the, geometrically, this is telling you that you are losing some information. Your, your, your matrix will squash um, an n-dimensional space into an n-minus-one-dimensional space. But maybe there's a, a more direct way of seeing this without trying to do the interpretation. Right at the back. Yeah, okay, so that's exactly right. So the point is, if we've got these two rows, called them row P and row Q, that are exactly the same, and we have the determinant of A, when we swap those two rows, on the one hand, your determinant stays exactly the same, right? Because there hasn't been any change. Row P and row Q are the same. But on the other hand, because you've swapped two rows, your determinant must change sign. So your determinant must be some value that is equal to its own negative. So you're looking for a number x such that x is equal to minus x. And there's only one number, 0, which is equal to its own negative. Right? So that's the basic idea. So let's write this up in some way. Okay? If you swap the identical rows, so if you swap the identical rows of A, then the determinant 
is unchanged, right? Because you haven't actually changed anything. The, the matrix looks exactly the same. And the determinant changes sign, right? So we've got to do two different things, which is really saying that the determinant of A must be equal to minus the determinant of A. And there's only one value that the determinant can take if it satisfies this relationship. The determinant of A must just be equal to zero. All right. Is everyone happy with this? So let's take a look at number fact five, what is it, 2.6, fact So if your matrix A has one row, which is a scalar multiple of the other, then the determinant of A is equal to zero. So this is a, a little bit more general than the thing we've just said. So over there, matrix A has two identical rows, if your determinant is zero. Actually, they don't even need to be identical. It's enough that if one of the rows is a scalar multiple of the other row, then the determinant is equal to zero. Why is this true? Linear dependent. Uh, so why does linear dependence mean that the determinant is zero? Because that, um, because if we are two, two by two matrix, then that um, um, area is turning to a line, and the line is not the area. So you are just very keen on the rank <laughs> D property. Um, again, you're right, but it's it's not um, it's not a way that we really think about the determinant yet. We haven't. We, we don't have these tools yet. We, we're not even actually going to see the rank nullity theorem. But yes, you're right. If one of them is a scalar multiple of the other, we've got some sort of linear dependence and then a zero determinant. But maybe there's a more direct way of seeing it over here. Um, you can scale the one row to be the same as the other. Yeah, that's exactly right. So the suggestion is we scale one of the rows uh, so that it's the same as the other. So that introduces a factor of k to our determinant. But now we've got two identical rows, so the determinant is zero. And then you've got to remember to take 0 and multiply it by k, and it's still 0. All right, so this is, I guess, let's just say it's a consequence of fact 2.5 and fact uh, 2.3. So it follows from fact 2.3 and fact 2.5. So explanation. Point three and from fact 2.5. So what we've shown for the first two elementary row operations is that if you scale a row by k, the determinant scaled, oh sorry, there's a question, yeah. Can I explain 2.5? So let's just go back up to 2.5, okay. So 2.5 says that if you've got two identical rows in a matrix, then the matrix has got a determinant of zero. And this is because if I took these two rows and I swapped them, we know that the value of the determinant must become, uh, uh, must change to get a minus sign. Because when you swap any two rows, you introduce a minus sign. But we also know that if I've got two identical rows and I swap them, the matrix still looks exactly the same, right? 
which means that the determinant shouldn't change sign. It should stay exactly the same because it's the same matrix. So on the one hand, your determinant should stay the same, and on the other hand, your determinant should change sign, which is what we have here. Your determinant should be the same thing as minus your determinant. And this is only true if your determinant is equal to zero. All right. So what we've shown now is we've shown that if you scale a row by k, the determinant is scaled by k. And if you swap two rows, then your determinant changes by a factor of minus one. And we've done some of these sort of corollaries or uh, implications of those two remarks. What we need to do now is we've got to show that if we take a multiple of one row and add it to another row, the determinant doesn't change. And we're not going to do that immediately, not do that directly. We first have to do a sort of intermediate result, which will be fact 2.7. So let A, B, and C So if we've got three matrices, A, B, and C, and A, B, and C be three square matrices with A, I, J equal to B, I, J equal to C, I, J. <laughs> in all the rows except one. So in all the rows except one, the entries are exactly the same. So all the rows except one, the entries are exactly the same. And in row P, and in row P, C, P, J, the entry in matrix C in row P in column J is just APJ plus BPJ. All right? CPJ is equal to APJ plus BPJ. Then the determinant of C is the determinant of A plus the determinant of B. And now we're going to try to explain why this is the case. Right, uh, we've got your explanation. In fact, we've got some time. I'm going to give you five minutes. Explain to yourselves why this is the case. Why must it be that if you've got three matrices, where the matrices are basically identical in all the rows except one row. And in that row, it looks like one of the matrices, the entries in that, that row are just the sum of the entries in the other two matrices. Why can we write this? Why is the determinant then of C just the determinant of A plus the determinant of B? And the suggestion I'm going to make is that think about expanding to calculate the determinant of C. Think about expanding to calculate the determinant of C along with this row P. And if you do that, then this actually turns out to be very obvious.
This is the this is the expression. Settle down, guys. This is the expression for the determinant of C. Um, it's just going to be these entries C P J minus one to the P plus J, right? And this O P J, I'm using O now for the minors of C, right? I've used M for the minors of A. I've used N for the minors of B. So now let's use O for the minors of C. So the first thing that you can do is you can take these CPJs and you can replace CPJ with APJ plus BPJ minus 1 to the P plus J. And then we still have these minus here, OPJ. And we can split this sum up. So we actually have two sums. We've got here this first sum over j. And this will be APJ minus 1 to the P plus J OPJ plus this sum here, j, BPJ minus 1 to the P plus J OPJ. And then the claim that we're going to make is that these minors OPJ in C are exactly the same as the minors MPJ in A and NPJ in B. And the reason for this is pretty similar to the reasoning we used earlier, right? Outside of this one row, all of the entries in A, B, and C are identical. And this one row where they're different is the row that we ignore when we calculate those minors. So the minors for all of these uh, matrices must be the same if we're in this row. So this is now the sum. J, APJ minus 1 to the P plus J, <coughs> MPJ plus sum here, J, BPJ minus 1 to the P plus J, NPJ. And this over here is the expression for the determinant of A, and this is the expression for the determinant of B. And I guess maybe we should write down this. This was the step where we had to sort of pay attention in row P minus identical. You know what, that's enough, right? I'm not going to write out the full explanation. Just in row P, the minors from the matrix A, B, and C are all the same, because the only differences between the matrices A, B, and C are in row P, and row P is omitted when you calculate the minors. So the determinant of C is equal to the determinant of A plus the determinant of B. Please don't think, I mean, it's very easy to get confused. It's not the case that C is equal to A plus B. No, C is only, it's only one row of C which is equal to A plus B. So it's not the determinant of the sum is equal to the sum of the determinants. That's not true. It's the determinant of this matrix C which is generated in a very particular way from A and B. Okay. Is everyone happy with what we've done over here? So then I'm just going to write up fact 2.8 and we'll probably only get to it tomorrow and you can think about it. Oh wait, sorry, there's a question. Hold on. Let's just Yeah. Isn't the determinant of A equals to zero? Why? No, I mean it was equal to zero in one of the previous examples because we said A was 
uh, a matrix with two identical rows or with uh, one row, which is scalar multiple over here. Over here, we don't know anything about A, B, and C other than the fact that C is related to A and B in this following way. We're saying, yeah, we're not saying that there are any rows in A which are the same as other rows in A. We're saying that the rows in A are the same as the rows in B, which are the same as the rows in C. Okay. Right. In fact, yeah, we'll, we'll finish off here. And if you've got any questions, I'll hang around at the front. Otherwise, I'll see you. New tutorial venue this afternoon, LS2A, if you have a Tuesday tutorial. <laughs>